screen and mute myself. So Sue, please take it away. Thank you, Jim. Hi, everyone. I'm Sue, and I'm out here in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I apologize for my very hefty voice. Uh, you're not supposed to get cold when you live out in the Southwest, but I have one. So if I need to excuse myself for a minute, I apologize ahead of time. But I have been eating lozenges, and I have my coat next to me. So I look forward to spending some time with you. First, I'd like to say that working with church and schools is exciting. Uh, it's fun and it's energizing. And uh, just uh, an outlier and statement that church and schools do not always have to do combined campaigns. There have been times I have done campaigns for standalone church needs and standalone school needs, even though they were uh, combined on a specific campus. Tonight, I'm going to be speaking specifically about the combination of a church and school campaign. First of all, you see my slide here that says resources to fund mission and ministry. We know that in a church or in a cathedral, the sources of ministry is your annual stewardship pledge and also your planned giving and your capital giving pledge. In a school, it is tuition and also the annual fund. <clears throat> Schools also have capital campaign giving and plan giving. And the question I'm usually and frequently asked initially when I come and have the opportunity to speak to a church and school leadership group is, if we have a capital campaign, will that decrease the amount of stewardship that we will receive during those three or four year pledge periods? It's been our experience and my experience personally that through the training process that we have within the capital campaign process, we actually have seen an opportunity to increase stewardship and actually increase the annual gift to the school during the time of a capital campaign. And when I'm there speaking with leadership, I talk about how that occurs. Very importantly, the annual fund is significant to the life of the school, and stewardship is significant to the life of the parish or cathedral. Neither should ever take the place of a capital campaign. We always make sure that we promote those first, if indeed we are combining it. But it actually ends up being a, uh, an opportunity to have a successful outcome for both. So what I want you to take away from this slide is it does not drain the resources that you are anticipating or prayerfully hoping for in stewardship or intuition. In addition to what I just shared with you, very importantly in the fundraising process, to reach a successful capital campaign, there are three steps, and I'll be speaking about them tonight. The first step is discernment. The second step is the feasibility study. And the third step is the ask capital campaign process. Most importantly, the discernment process and the feasibility study process and the capital campaign process are, is offered by the Episcopal Church Foundation in three separate contracts. Purpose being, we want to make sure that we have key indicators that we can measure at the, we believe, the successful ending of each of those three modules before we would move to the next one. And that's the purpose of that. In the fundraising process, the least visible part is, of course, identifying the need for the church and school, identifying church vestry and school board relationship. And let me highlight that. Um, there are many, many relationships that church vestries and school boards share. Some have a 501c3 capacity of ownership some are very loosely uh, entwined. Uh, some are very uh, uh, respectful of each other's participation in each other's boards. Some are ex officio members. And one of the things we do early on is to identify that relationship to be sure, again, that we are really respecting what the culture is of that particular church and school. 
when we identify the potential donors from the church and school differently from if we're doing a standalone church or a standalone school campaign, we are aware that the donors from the church and school could very much be the same person. For instance, we might have a family member, a husband and wife, or a family member that is a member of the church and they have a child in the school. We might have someone that uh, is in the church and is the grandparent of a child in the school. We might have um, a, a combination of people who were previous parishioners, but their children are now attending the school, but they're now attending a different church. So at the time that we begin to consider moving forward with the opportunity of discernment, the very first step, we want to make sure that we understand who the donors are, who are the potential donors, and who have an investment into the church and school. And many times, one of the very first things that I recommend is let's look at the databases at the church and school. If the databases haven't really been addressed for a number of years, this is the time to do it, so that when we actually move into the process of reaching out and communicating and using our database as our basis basic of information, we want to make sure that we are representing ourselves as being extremely responsible and not absolutely making sure that we're not setting three or four or five uh, similar pieces of information to one person because they happen to have five different names in two different databases. So we want to make sure that we clean that database up and we have an understanding as to who those potential individuals are that might be interested in uh, participating in a proposed capital campaign for the church and school. We talk about communicating the vision, then we want to ask for support, we want to say thank you, and we want to continue the process. So let's really start to look at it more, more, with, with more um, minutia of information. In discernment, we have visioning, prayer, involvement, planning, and communication. And I'm going to go to the next slide to speak, actually I'm going to skip this slide and come back to it if you're comfortable with that. I want to talk about what we do with discernment. Remember again, I'm sometimes called to a church and school and a church will say to me, well, you know, um, we need to increase our chapel, we need a new roof, and we also want to make sure that the school has enhancements to their gymnasium. Well, my question is, uh, church vestry folks and leadership, has, has this been shared with the school? Uh, there was an instance a number of years ago where I went to a school and church, a very prominent school and church, very large, and I was invited to participate in discernment. And I had been invited in by the church, and I had requested that they invite the board and leadership from the school since it was going to be a combined campaign. When I arrived there, it had ended up where? The school presented a master plan that the church vestry had never seen. And consequently, there was an understanding that there were two visions as to what a capital campaign could actually um, represent for each of them. So what discernment does is it really says, what is God calling you to do or to become? So together, not singly, we begin to identify needs. The school begins to identify needs that they need, that they would like to see a capital campaign benefit from. And then, of course, the church has a list of needs. And I always call discernment as the time that we begin to do our listing of projects. In order to do that, we always make sure that whatever the projects are in the end align with the vision and the mission of both the church and the school, remembering again that most times the school is an outreach mission of the church. And something that I am seeing more and more of today is that um, a larger percentage of the folks that are involved in the school as a student might not necessarily be Christian, or they are attending a different church with their parents. So many times feedback that I receive early on, and we want to make sure that we're addressing early on, is why should I give to the school? I pay tuition, I participate in the annual fund. After all, it's the church's responsibility. This is the church school. 
That's a question that, that I frequently hear, and we address it. And we make sure that people understand that we want them to prayerfully consider gifting. We also look at the fact that we have children in the school. Uh, we might have three children from one family. One might be at an early age, one might be in mid-school, and one might be going into high school. This, this particular school might not have a high school, so therefore that child is going to a private high school. And we also want to begin to address whether or not, as an as a individual who's going to be able to participate in gifting, do they have the opportunity to uh, gift when we know that they're going to be asked to gift at their older child's new school. So there's a lot of involvement of conversation that we have very early on so that things that could potentially be seen as challenges, we identify early on and we make it opportunity. We want to make sure that we're communicating the vision to all of the parishioners who are participants in the church as well in the school. We want to make sure that that communication is also being sent to those parents whose children are attending the school, but they are attending a different church. Next slide shows that what is the term usually covering? It usually covering new building projects. It might cover um, deferred maintenance or preventative maintenance. Many times it will cover program needs or seed money. Uh, I've been working recently with an organization, a church, that is looking to fund chairs uh, in the particular school program. It will fund endowment, and it also can fund debt retirement. And the most, um, the most successful school and church uh, campaigns that I've had the pleasure of uh, journeying with and facilitating are the ones where the project list actually addresses not only a school need, but a church needs, so that it, the parishioners who are specific to only the church, maybe they've never had children in the school, say, I'm prayerfully going to consider gifting this particular capital campaign because it's going to be funding something that I will enjoy in my sanctuary or in my parish hall. And there will be some that will say, uh, I had children attend the school. They're no longer attending now but I appreciate what my children learned, and I want to make sure that I still continue to support the school. So there's lots of things that we do that help to energize through um, communication uh, the opportunity for people to find what spiritually is going to engage them to participate in the discernment process as well as in the end of a being asked for a gift if it becomes a successful opportunity for a capital campaign. What are you called to do? And how will these projects help you do it better and more faithfully? Importantly, too, it says, how do you move forward with discernment? This is the fun part. This is really the fun part. You form a committee with parishioners and school constituents. And then with that committee, you do a lot of training of facilitating on how to prospect for opportunities of ideas, usually a church or a school combined, have a list of projects, and that's the purpose they've called us in. We would like to do X, Y, and Z. And what I always say, which is our methodology, is we want to open this opportunity to all parishioners and school constituents. We want to stir their hearts. We want to engage them. We want to energize them. And we want them to know that their opinion and their thoughts are extremely important to us. So we do that through small group meetings and all parish and school meetings. In addition to them knowing that they can also send information to me personally so that if there's something confidential that they want to share with me, for instance, there might be a rector or there might be a head of school that absolutely wants to build a particular addition and they know that this is endearing to that particular person. But in their opinion, this is not what they want to see happen, but they're not very comfortable sharing that verbally because they don't want to hurt that person's feelings. So they're going to share that with me usually in an email. And once all that information is gathered, once all of these groups have, have met, we come away with a whole list of opportunities and ideas of what could be included in a proposed capital campaign 
if this was to move forward. And then from that, we have ongoing communication throughout this process. There is a communication plan that I write along with someone from the church and school. In addition to that, the vestry and the school board take that list of projects, look at it, and say, does this align with our vision and our mission? And if so, then let's move forward with it and let's get some thumbnail sketches and some thumbnail costs of what it will cost to have this completed. I always share with leadership. Do not worry if there's a perception that you believe that you are going to have a campaign for $1 million and this project list ends up being $3 million. As long as the projects on the list are aligned with your mission and vision, our next module, the feasibility study, will help rank order and bring reality, and I'll share with you how that occurs, so that you will end up with an opportunity to have a proposed capital campaign that will be successful. So this is the time to really, really, really uh, appreciate what your parishioners and your school constituents are willing to bring forward and they're willing to participate in some of your meetings. When we get to the point where we're ready to go to a feasibility study, when I go back to the last slide, what I want to do is to make sure that we're ready. And let me share with you how we measure that. If I was to attend a church um, service on a Sunday, once the discernment had been completed, I would want to be able to ask those folks, folks, are you aware that, it, that there is a proposed planned capital campaign underway here at this church and school. And I want to hear that at least 80% of the folks knew it. Whether or not they chose to participate in any of the meetings or any of the processes is an outlier. I want to make sure that they knew that there was one underway being planned and that they had been invited into it. And my second question is, could you share with me what some of the projects are that are in that proposed capital campaign. And there again, if I was at church services on Sunday or at a major meeting of the school, I want to hear that those two constituents had indicated that they both knew that there was a proposed capital campaign underway and that 80% of them knew what the project list would be. So there again, that is how we would close the sermon and say, we are now ready to move towards a feasibility study. Now, before I go any further, I'm just going to go back here for a moment to where I had the big sign that said questions. I'm going to stop for a moment and see if you have any questions. I'm going to take a drink. Well, I'm going to move forward, and I'm going to go to the feasibility study. And you certainly have time to come up with questions at the end. We will have time to do that. Let's talk about the feasibility study. As you know, we have had discernment. We're going to believe that the church and school have come together. They have, had, they have come up with a list of projects that both the school board and the church vestry are, are comfortable with, have agreed that we can move forward with it, and are aligned with the mission and the vision of both the church and the school. So what does the feasibility study do? It's going to measure awareness and support. It's going to identify the goals. It's going to identify volunteers. It's going to prioritize projects. I call that rank ordering. And it's going to weigh intangibles that may affect your campaign. And what do we mean by that? During the process, we're going to work with our graphic artists, usually. And we create a, a, a tentative case statement. <coughs> the case statement is going to say, this is the compelling reason why the church and school want to move forward with a capital campaign. And then inside, when you open up the tentative case statement, it's going to list all the projects with a very brief narrative that is very understandable to anyone that's reading it, even if it's the first time. And then it's also going to have the cost of each of those projects. It's also going to have usually a list of leadership that's participated in the process. And then I, as a consultant or the Episcopal Church consultant, will have created 
a gifts essential chart which says that in order to achieve this goal that we are testing for, we will need these gifts, prayerfully considered by the parishioners and the school constituents. So if the goal is a million dollars, it will show a rank ordering of a gift possibly beginning at 100000 going down to 100000 over three years, all the way down to $500 or less. And it will rank order how many we need in each of those categories, 10000 15000 20000 3000 5000 And it will indicate to the folk who, who are reading this and participating in the process what their gift potentially could be, and it would also address to them and show them what it would be individually on a monthly basis to make sure that it fits into their financial plan of their lifestyle. This is printed, and there are two ways that it's distributed along with an 18 uh, question questionnaire that will support the contents of the feasibility study. It is distributed two ways, actually three ways. One way is where uh, the consultant with me would be on site at the church and school, and I would meet with a number of uh, significant donors over a period of days. It usually is a 45-minute conversation where I ask them the same exact questions that everyone else will be receiving, except I do it one-on-one. -on -one. The purpose being, number one, our criteria is we like to have these individuals, participants, from the church as well as the school being individuals who can gift at a very substantial level. I also want to speak to some leadership. The purpose being, we know that there are many followers in churches and in school constituencies. So if leaders are in favor of a proposed capital campaign, we know that many people will be very willing to say, well, if Mr. Johnson says it's a good decision, I think I will participate in it as well. And then I also want to speak to, and I know that I always hear this, that churches never have any curmudgeons, but I always ask them to import them if they don't. The key is I want to speak to a few, even, even from the school, who have already indicated very, neg very negative concerns about um, a proposed capital campaign. The purpose is I do not want to change their mind, but being the outsider consultant, I want to prospect for the reason, because when leadership makes a, makes a decision, I want it to be as informed as possible. So therefore, I look forward to having that information as well embedded into the report that we will be bringing back to leadership. The other two ways that it's distributed is by SurveyMonkey, which we manage, and also by um, direct mail, which is also about um, the uh, the direct mail is also the way that individuals choose to receive the survey, and then all of that is returned to us confidentially through an envelope that comes directly back to the Episcopal Church Foundation. So consequently, it moves forward. It takes about two to three months to complete, and then when I come back to report out the results, what we learn is the following, and I'm just going to stay on the feasibility study campaign. Feasibility study report is going to indicate to the leadership, number one, and this, is, again, the feasibility study report needs to be very transparent. So after I have reported it out to leadership, we want to make sure that it's reported out to the folks in the school as well as to the folks in the congregation. Very, very importantly, I also say, it's very important to have a copy that individuals can check out either from the school office or the church office, so that there is a, an, an awareness that nothing is being hidden from them. Uh, the transparency is significant to the success of the outcome. The feasibility study I call the voice of the parish and the voice of the school constituent. It's going to allow you to know, as leaders, whether or not you can move forward with a proposed capital campaign. And let me share with you what you learned. You're going to learn, number one, if people are in favor of a proposed capital campaign. You're going to learn uh, the, the support of a proposed capital campaign. You're going to have a whole list of volunteers who are willing to participate if it should move forward. And very importantly, two key indicators that you need to make decisions. <laughs> number one is you're going to know what projects your parishioners 
congregation and what projects your school constituents are willing to support because they're going to rank order them. So consequently, if we've tested for $3 million, we might come back and say to you, you can raise $1.6 million. And you're going to say, well, if that's the case, then what does $1.6 million fund? Because we tested for $3 million, and the $3 million covered many, many projects. What we'll share with you is, let's look at the rank ordering. And the rank ordering will show you one, two, three, four, and five, the top five projects that your parishioners and your school constituents will be willing to support. What I have learned, and I learned this from a church and school that I worked with previously many years ago, there will be a time, and it's an outlier, but there might be a time when something very, very important needs to happen, and it's not in your top five priorities. It does not mean that leaders still can't do that project. But what you need to do is to go back to your congregation, and you need to go back to your, your school constituents and ask them for permission after they have seen the full feasibility study to move that project up to the top five with the awareness that the bottom ranking one is going to fall off and give them the reason why. It has happened before, and they have never been refused because they've asked permission. I worked with a church and school a number of years ago, and there was tremendous pushback when I first arrived. And I learned it's because they had raised money for a project in a previous campaign. Once the money was raised, the leadership made a decision to do a different project and had not asked for permission. So consequently, they needed to be assured that this was going to take place. And we did it by a number of ways, in addition to setting up a separate bank account that could only be funded by the particular dollars that were coming in from the capital campaign. And that was just one of many ways that we assured our congregation. And we had a very, very successful capital campaign. So in the feasibility study, you're also going to learn <coughs> particular gifts that people say they are willing to gift. You're going to know what we believe will be a proposed real actual goal that can be achieved. And I will share with you, as you see, 92% of ECF clients meet or exceed recommended goal. And I'm very happy to say the last three campaigns I had the uh, privilege of managing, we exceeded goal. Uh, it's because, again, the Episcopal Church Foundation comes with a very logical, spiritually engaging methodology. And it works. In the feasibility study also, we will also identify people who are interested in learning more about planned giving. So consequently, the feasibility study is the voice of the parish. It is very strong if you've had a very strong um, discernment process because it's going to continue to build on that momentum that started early on when the leader first called and said, we'd like you to come and talk with us about the proposed potential capital campaign. And as I've talked, you will hear and you see hopefully how the ripples just continue to get larger and larger and the circle of people engaged become greater and greater and greater. Now I'm Sue, stop can, I, can I ask a question, Sue? Sue? Yes, you can. Yes, I, I think there is a, a question or two on the floor. Is this a good time to uh, just ask a couple? I was just going back to that. Yes, absolutely. Please do. Um, I know Terry will probably come off on off of mute to ask uh, her own question, but there was a question asked previously of when should we start talking about the capital campaign to the congregation? My recommendation has been what I have learned from experience from working with so many congregations is very, very early on, even if it's just a two line statement in your newsletter or or an email blast, the fact that leadership is talking about the proposed potential opportunity of a capital campaign with the school early as early as you can. Okay. Uh, Terry, did you have another question that um, was out in the chat that you wanted to repeat uh, for Sue? No, I think that's the question. You got the question that I was um, okay. funneling to Sue. Sorry, just wanted to double check. So, sorry, Sue. Please, please proceed yeah. on to the next That's stage. Fine. And, and again, it's never too early. 
uh, even if a vestry has had a conversation, make sure it's in your vestry uh, minutes, and make sure there's just one or two line sentence saying, you know, we're beginning to consider the potential opportunity of a proposed capital campaign. So congregations as well as school con constituents do not feel blindsided. That's, that's really important. I now am at the capital campaign uh, slide, and you see where it says four to six months process. I want you to know this is really, really a lot of fun. And the reason I say that is because the Episcopal Church Foundation has a methodology that makes it very, very um, adaptable and comfortable. Because as you know, I'm sure, I have gone to churches and schools across this land for more years than I want to mention. And I have never had a church or school with people raising their hands saying to me, Sue, please ask me to ask people for money. I just love asking people for money. That's just not part of our culture. So we have a methodology where we do a lot of preparation. We create a lot of chairs. Again, those circles of energy and engagement grow and grow. And the more involved, the more awareness people will be, the more engaged and the more energized they will become, and the greater your gifts. Many chairs. We have many committees. We have what we call the silent gift phase. We have the congregational and the school phase. We have different ways of uh, sharing the brochure of the particular capital campaign, which is created for you, that's specific to the projects that are going to be funded. <laughs> it speaks to the goal. It speaks to leadership. And importantly, uh, the advanced gift phase goes out first. Those individuals are trained by us. It's fun. We do role playing. And by the time they leave the training, which is usually an hour or an hour and a half, there's a lot of laughter, role playing, and they actually leave energized to make sure that um, their brochure and their pledge card is delivered and that they do that one-on-one -on -one opportunity as long as the culture of the church and the school are comfortable with that. That's what we strongly recommend, one-on-one -on -one opportunity. People become engaged, and the ambassador, the person making the call, will ask that individual that they're calling upon to join in with them and prayerfully, prayerfully consider gifting the capital campaign. Capital campaign will carry a name. And once we have the advanced gift to silent phase, uh, all, all brochures uh, distribute and hopefully the majority of the pledge cards back. We have a major event called the kickoff, which we actually celebrate and unveil the gifts that we've received to date. Usually there's a wonderful thermometer that ends up in the narthex and in the school entryway, or sometimes it's even out by the, uh, the pickup line by the, the, uh, by the car where the parents come by to pick up their children. Many times we place the, um, we energize the parents to remember to turn in their pledge card by making sure it's out there by the the line of the cars when they come to pick up their children. We also make sure that we track all of the brochures so that no one is overlooked and no one receives double. We have a software program that's able to accompany the process. You have an opportunity to use that if you choose, or there are times that we will engage whatever the software program is that you have on the property. Then, of course, very importantly, thank you, thank you, thank you. Volunteers are thanked. We have a dedication day when the volunteers are thanked for their dedication and are blessed by the rector and the head of school is there as well. And importantly, it's very helpful if the head of school and the rector is engaged and involved. Very helpful. I will share with you, however, that I have worked in environments where the rector was an interim or the head of school was an interim. And as long as you have leadership that takes the that takes the responsibility and is compelled to make sure that this is very, very successful, it will be. It's the leadership that leads. And I always think of the Episcopal Church Foundation as the wind and the sails of that opportunity. So in a, in a, in a nutshell, I've given you a, a very brief overview of a church and school campaign. I hope I've highlighted some areas that might have been giving you some concern. But, um, 
I see something here in presenter notes that says from the school, from the church, that they have had a campaign in the last two years. Carrie, can you help me understand what that means? Is that a question that's being asked of me? Yes, we have a question from a parish where the church has had a capital campaign in the past few years, and they're now beginning to work on their endowment. How does the school get buy-in from the congregation on such a campaign? At this point, I need to know more about what the campaign funded for the church. I want to know what the pledging uh, time frame is when that pledging process would be completed. And then I need to know what the, ch what the school would be needing in addition to growing the endowment of the church. Possibly a new campaign would fund an endowment for the church in addition to what the school would be needing. But I need more information on that. Well, if the, I the school has they're in the second year of three years of pledge collection. So they're almost finished with their pledge collection. Then you'd have to have a, I would recommend having a conversation with Vestry about the pulse of the congregation. Are they feeling celebratory about their previous campaign? Was it successful? Are they reaching goal? Are the written uh, pledges actually being funded? Or is there an attrition that they're experiencing? You can actually have a campaign, follow a campaign. I've seen that done successfully. But only, again, once you, once you have uh, identified the challenges and make them into opportunities. Again, engagement of the individuals who potentially will become the people who give. That's what I would recommend. OK. I see one more person typing. Catherine, do you have a question? OK, for now, no, go ahead for now. If, it, if the question pops up later, we'll take a break for that. OK. I just turned to uh, professional campaign materials. This is a campaign that I recently completed in Texas for a church and school. <coughs> they needed to build a new building in this particular economy uh, because their building was being condemned. And we had a very successful capital campaign. Uh, this is the inside of the campaign um, brochure that is completed for a capital campaign, and it's accompanied by a pledge card. And then here is another campaign that I did in uh, Glen Allen, Virginia, about five years ago for a brand new building for their youth center. It's outside of Richmond, Virginia, and uh, they, are, they, are, they are so pleased that they have almost 500 youth attending their church. So uh, the original building was just bursting at the seams. We had a very successful capital campaign there. That was about four years ago. Um, and again here, but finally the workmen, and I'm sure you're all familiar with X36, 1 through 7. And then at last, the people were restrained from bringing more. The key to a very successful capital campaign is communication and engaging and engaging and engaging and continuing to inviting in those people who potentially will be gifting. I'm going to stop here now. And then, Terry, if more questions come, I'm available. And then I know that you're going to be discussing some things about do you need a consultant. So I'm going to turn it over to the rest of you who are participating. And I'm waiting for questions. I'm going to take a drink. OK. I see a question, do we set a goal for a single amount for both parts, or do we seek donations for each? What if a parishioner wants to donate to the church but not to the school? Great question. Let me share with you what we recommend. We set a goal for the total amount for all projects that are being tested. Uh, you will have some parishioners <coughs> who will indicate that they will only give if they can be assured it's only going to go to the church part. Or you will have someone from the school indicate that they will only gift if it goes to the, to the school. When that is asked of you, one needs to respect it and abide by it. The key is in a combined capital campaign, we continue to communicate that we are hoping that they will gift to the total of need, not to a single need. And the only time that you'll see that opportunity for people to 
gift at a higher level for a specific need is if the culture of the church and school is one where naming opportunities is something very, um, very comfortable for them. And then, of course, it's to a specific item in a specific area. And that we would encourage. But again, those are conversations I have with leadership early on because we're here to respect uh, the culture of the church and school, not to tell you how you're to run your, your, your the process. Okay, we have another question. Can you give us an idea of how much time is needed before the feasibility study? In other, how long do those small group sessions usually take? <laughs> Well, you know, it all depends upon when I arrive at the church and school, where they are in the discernment. I sometimes arrive and leaders have been meeting together or individually, and they already have a list of items or things or, or stuff that they want to raise money for. So the key is if you're already there, we have a, a jumping off point, and we start that as the leadership list, and then we expand on it. If I arrive and it's because leaders of the church and school are of the opinion they would like to have a combined campaign and each has an idea of what each needs, but they need to expand on it, that's when we begin to really work on having our small groups as well as our large groups. Discernment, in my experience working with the constituents from the church and the school, can take from three months to two years. And, it, and, and what makes the decision is the acceleration of the desire of the particular church and school. We can move it through quickly as long as some key indicators and items are managed and effectively um, broadcast to those two, two groups of, of uh, constituents. I hope that answers your question. And then what if the church is ready to go now, but the school is a year or two behind? Then we need to bring the school up to speed. Uh, you both really need to be on <laughs> the same jumping off point. Now, having said that, I'm also aware that a church uh, sees themselves as the outreach ministry that has established the school. So it would not be at all unusual for a church to say to me, and I've had this done before, we'd like to move forward with a capital campaign, and we believe our parishioners are willing to gift these following dollar amounts to fund X, Y, and Z at the school. So we're not anticipating a large participation by our school constituents. If I hear that, I would say, let's give them an opportunity to join in. Even though you're sharing with me that you believe that this could be the capital campaign of choice, there might be an opportunity to expand it and even grow and uh, have more blessings come upon the church and school. So again, it would be based upon the conversation I would initially have with the leadership as to when that would move forward. But I certainly would want to have them pretty close to being on the same level when a, ch when a church and school campaign begins, unless a church has specific needs that need to be done now and they want to do a standalone capital campaign. That, that's, that's another conversation. Okay, thank you. I am going to start my webcam. And Julie, I'm going to ask you to take over minding the chat in case I have questions that I missed. This will take a few minutes to start the sharing. There we go. Can everybody see me now? We can see you fine. Greetings. We can see you fine. And I will uh, take a peek at chat, so no worries. OK. Um, the next phase in our discussion, we've got about oh, a little bit less than 10 minutes left. And I wanted to give you a chance to consider questions about Support, outside support. Do you need a consultant? What kind of consultant? What sorts of questions should you ask as you interview consultants? Um, the truth is, it is possible to have a capital campaign without a consultant. Um, people also lift cars. 
I've seen very good campaigns done without consultants, but it adds a whole new layer of work to the work of the headmaster, the rector, or the dean of the cathedral. Um, so one of the things the consultant should be doing for you is keeping that focus on the campaign so that you can continue to run the parish and or the school. A good consultant will do as many capital campaigns in a year as most congregations or schools will do in their entire lifetime, which means that they bring a breadth and depth of experience that it's pretty rare to have in, on your staff in school. That also means that they tend to come with um, a broader point of view that makes for a little bit more neutral approach. Um, that means that they can take all that confidential information that Sue was telling you about earlier home with them in the trunk of their car or back on the plane in their suitcase. And that drastically reduces those parking lot conversations that we've all had so many of um, among parents and among our parishioners. Finally, it's important to bear in mind human nature being what it is. Um, you can fire a consultant. You hire them, you can fire them, and human nature being what it is, that has an effect on accountability and timeliness. Um, capital campaigns that are managed by outside counsel tend to happen, occur on a, in a more timely way. They tend to raise more money. It's a documented fact. This last bullet point I want to emphasize has to do with um, that experience that I was talking about earlier. Many, many organizations get into ethical issues because of the lack of experience. They don't see one or two steps down the road and don't realize that a decision they've made that seems well-informed and well-intentioned will, in fact, compromise their um, standing a little bit farther down the line with their donors. Now, I see I have a question here, Ron. Um, it seems that the school could have a much larger donor pool, including private foundations and corporations. So can I try, um, hand that one off to you? I think you've got some good experience there. What's your sense of that? Uh, my experience has been that the time that we've had opportunities with private foundations has been a child of a family of a private foundation has attended the school. Uh, corporations uh, have issues with gifting to a religious organization, but I'm, I'm always uh, engaged and energized to um, research names that are indicated. And in our um, feasibility study, we do ask that question. Do you know of any foundations or organizations that could potentially gift, as well as another question we ask is, do you know of any capital campaigns occurring at this time? We want to make sure that people who are in the Episcopal environment many times are people who gift other nonprofits, and we want to make sure we're not competing for those same dollars. So interesting. But um, we're always willing to um, re research opportunities with foundations as well as corporations. The DuPont Group, by the way, is an organization, a corporation, that does fund um, religious organizations. Yes, yes. So if you're looking at consultants, and you should be, you should be looking at several. Um, we tend to recommend, if you can afford it, um, that you kind of cover the gamut, a small sort of mom and pop shop close by, um, maybe a large uh, um, proprietary firm, if you can afford that. ECF I tend to think of as um, occupying a special space in the middle. I came to the Episcopal Church Foundation from one of those larger, um, more proprietary consulting firms that trained me when I worked in an Episcopal school, actually. So I have to say that I was a little skeptical of how our knowledge of the Episcopal Church might be so instrumental in our success. 
since that time, I've cleaned up after a fair number of secular firms that didn't know things like that you need the diocese, the permission of the diocese to encumber your property, that um, the vestry has fiduciary responsibility, not the rector, and that boards of schools are sometimes separate from the vestry, and sometimes the vestry serves as the board of the school. These are all things that, at the Episcopal Church Foundation, they're sort of pro forma for us. They're part of the knowledge that we bring to your campaign. Um, as the slide says here, we've got 25 years of successful management. We have a, about a dozen consultants across the country operating at any given time. So if you multiply that, you start to see the range of um, experience available to you. Um, we've got some questions about whether or not the church and school campaign will go forward together. Is it a waste of time and money to do a feasibility study if only the church is ready now, or should we wait and decide first whether the two campaigns will go forward together and then do a feasibility study for both? That is one that goes back to that breadth and depth of experience. Sue, I know you've looked at some like that. Why don't you take that one as well? What I would like to do is whoever asked that question, I'd like to have a sidebar conversation with them just to learn a little bit more. Uh, we're here to serve. And I would prefer to do one feasibility than two, um, but I really need more information so that the guidance and uh, counsel that we give you would be the appropriate one for your opportunity. So if you'd like to call me or email me, I'll be more than happy to, to have a continued discussion. Or actually, that comes from Katherine Watson. And Katherine, if you would like to type your contact information into the chat. Um, I'm happy to make sure that Sue gets that and she can do a follow-up conversation with you um, at no obligation. And uh, you um, can type that, you can type that, Catherine, into a private chat so that that is kept confidential. So you can do that. If you'd prefer, you can also send us an email and um, we'll be happy to assist you with that as well. There you go. Do we have any other questions while we're stopped? We actually, we there is someone who's typing, and it's, it's just come up. So we're, uh, we can proceed. We actually don't have any other questions. So if you'd like uh, to take the next uh, couple of slides, Terry, and then we can wrap up for the evening. Yes, actually, what I'd like to make sure that you capture here, and we will be sending the PDF of this file, there's some very good capital campaign resources on our website. I encourage you to download these. We're happy to mail them to you for a small fee, but you can download them for free. They're sample client materials and a client list um, uh, of people you should feel free to contact. Here are two really effective and short that, that's part of what makes them so effective. Uh, publications that I would recommend you get as small gifts for your vestry and your school board in terms of how to integrate a capital campaign into your board process, into the daily and spiritual life of your congregation and your school. I'm going to hand this over now in just a minute to Jim. But I see, Catherine, we've got a couple more, another question here. No, we're OK. Jim, I'm going to hand this off to you. Well, thank you, Terry. And thank you, Sue, especially uh, for this wonderful webinar that you've conducted tonight. Um, just as a wrap up to everyone out there, as many of you know, we seek at the Episcopal Church Foundation to empower your leadership. We seek to support all Episcopal organizations, which includes Episcopal schools. And I am very, very proud uh, to say that the Episcopal Church Foundation has been very active with Episcopal schools. I've met uh, several of you at the uh, biennial events for the National Association of Episcopal Schools. 
we have been pleased to work with NAES in a number of ways, both on their uh, planned giving work as well as their endowment building work. We actually um, are very pleased to be supporting them and other schools in that effort. Thank you all for coming tonight. I just wanted to close with letting you know that uh, we recorded this webinar and we'll be sending that out to everyone along with some other resources. We have a number of webinars which are available to you which have been listed on the screen. In addition, we have some fantastic webinars coming up. One tomorrow night, which we still have a few spots open for if you would like to uh, register, you are certainly welcome so to do, um, and that is on spending rules for endowments. Uh, something that is crucially important for not overspending or for that matter under spending your endowment. So that will be a great opportunity for learning. We have some other events coming up that will be quite beneficial for your parishes such as uh, two coming up on annual stewardship, one on April 9th focusing on effective communication and another on April 23rd making the case for your parish which its real title online is why should I give to you? And uh, that is something which any parish or school can certainly benefit from. We'll also have an overview of uh, capital campaigns coming up done by Terry Mathis on April 16th. So just in closing, thank you uh, for spending your evening with us tonight. We're happy to serve. We're willing to and able. And we're ready to help you in any way that we can. And whether or not uh, that you choose ECF, uh, for your capital campaign firm, please do, please do seek professional consultation in that area. As Terry said, you typically don't operate on yourself, nor do you lift a car by yourself. So please take that to heart. And thank you again, all of you, for being here tonight. Have a great evening. Good night. Thank you. Good night.